even with the best decision-making policy, uh, things can be thwarted by certain events, certain dynamics. If you've had any experience serving in the church, some of these things are going to be quite familiar to you. You know, they're going to need to learn to deal with them because they affect every church and they'll affect your church as well as mine. Let's look at some. The first one is when you have a decision that goes against tradition. Now, most traditions start out good. Even the Apostle Paul spoke of traditions in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. He says, now I praise you. He's speaking to the carnal Corinthians. They did do some things, right? He says, now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. Now, the word tradition in this passage simply means that which is handed down. In Paul's case, it refers to the truths handed down from the apostolic teaching. So we see some traditions are biblical. As a matter of fact, later on in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, Paul speaks of the Lord's Supper. That's one such tradition. And he's very specific. It involves two symbols, the bread and the wine. And this carries the weight of Scripture. Other traditions are not so much scriptural mandates, but they're creative solutions to problems or challenges of ministry. For example, back in the 1780s, a few centuries ago, Sunday school began. It was promoted by Robert Reichs in England as an effort to reach children who are being sucked up by the Industrial Revolution. As I understand it, the children were working all weekend long and many of them were, most of them were illiterate. So Sunday school was a creative, innovative way uh, to limit child labor and to help them learn to read. And interestingly, their primary text was reading the Bible. The idea became popular and spread to the U.S. By the mid-19th century, one historian has said, the Sunday school attendance was a near universal aspect of childhood. Sunday school, as we have seen, has become a tradition that few churches would even think of eliminating. The word tradition, um, today as we use the word, we, it includes any action or ministry that has become identified as an unchanging practice in the church. These are activities, these are ministries that are tried and they're shown to be effective. But over time, they can become set in stone, even when the reason for the original impl implementation or the reason for why we implemented it the way we did may have changed and is no longer there. We tend to think well of a tradition if we like it. But if we don't, then we feel the church is unbending because it won't change. Traditionalism we throw out there very easily. But I know that this can happen and sneak up on us so easily. I've been involved in a new church plant, for example, and we've had lots of creativity and innovation. We had new music, we had new instruments, and we were meeting at different times. We weren't going against anybody's tradition because we didn't have a tradition. We were starting from scratch, brand new. But I noticed after about five years, some things became hard to change. Whereas when we first began, we could experiment and we tried lots of things. We had a saying that went like this, nothing's permanent unless it works. But we discovered, I discovered, that everybody got used to sitting in the same seats. We got used to listening to the same music. And then someone came in, and I remember this as clear as it happened today. Someone came in and asked why we didn't change a certain thing that we were doing. And I found forming in my mind those dreaded words, because that's the way we always do it. I was surprised at myself. Some traditions are good, some are neutral. But some may encase unbiblical perspectives or hinder biblical perceptions. And sometimes a, a tradition, a style, or a method was good, but it, there comes a time when we need to change it to be, become more adaptable and to become more effective. And we need to confront those things face to face. To think through carefully when our, we're faced with a decision to change something that we've always done. To think through carefully the original reasons for what has now become a tradition and what are the reasons for continuing it or discontinuing it. We need to have the courage to be able to speak about these things openly. A church that is unable or unwilling to think critically of its own traditions, and by critically I mean not to criticize but to, meet, to analytically think through clearly. 
Such a church is a church that will stagnate and be left behind in reaching the current generation. There is much evidence to this happening when you see churches that have only senior saints and very few young people. A friend of mine recently told me about a church that he was involved in where the older folks bemoaned that many young people never attended the worship service. Many of them were leaving. My friend asked them, what are you willing to sacrifice so that the whole church meets together for worship, including the young people, since that was their concern? He put it in terms of what are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to sacrifice the length of the meeting? Are you willing to sacrifice your preference for the style of worship music? Or are you willing to sacrifice the dress code, whether it's written and spoken or whether it's unspoken? Traditions can change, but it requires sacrifice. So we need to understand that sometimes traditions are so, so ingrained that it can hinder good decision making, but we need to confront it directly. Now a second thing that can hinder good decision making is when the decision goes against an inbred history. Now this is related to the difficulty of traditions, but it concerns something that has a specific history of difficulty. This is what we might call in some places the sacred cow. Something that everybody knows that if you bring it up, conflict will pick up where it last left off and there will be continued difficulties. Many churches have these things. This has been a, an unsettling compromise maybe in, a, in, in ignoring a problem that was, uh, couldn't be agreed to. It may be there was a, an unholy truth has been tacitly accepted for the sake of maintaining unity or at least avoiding further conflict. But you need to understand carefully the background. A sacred cow is an issue that has never been resolved in the first place. I think of one, for example, that I was involved in as a young believer in a, in a church, a small church. I had just been exposed to the issues of the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. And I was, it was my first interaction with it. I read something in a book and I was excited about what I was learning. So I spoke about it with the youth group I was leading. Well, I was told the next Sunday that the church had decided a few years ago that no one was to speak teach or preach on the subject, whether from the platform on a Sunday morning or whether in a youth group or in a small group Bible study. No one was to even address that decision one way or the other. I was totally bewildered. <laughs> there was a history. The whole church was inflamed. They didn't know how to discuss the matter and to deal with extreme viewpoints that were being thrown about. No one was listening to each other and no one was studying the issue. Well, looking back on it now, I can see that that was an issue that was going to take some time for healing because it wasn't just the theological issue, it was the emotions and the characterizations that were being thrown back and forth. In some regard, you know, each person has to decide, is this the hill that I want to plant my flag on? And I found as a young person, I just had to set it aside because I couldn't address it. I didn't want to make it an issue and I was advised by an older brother, just leave it set. This isn't the time or the place to deal with it. Elders must be those who hold faithfully to the Word of God and they're apt to teach. And there should be no sacred cows that the elder is afraid to interact with and to deal with, no matter how uncomfortable it might be. Now here's another thing that can hinder good decision making. It's when a decision is being considered that goes against one or a few what I would call strong men. One strong-minded person can influence others and could put a stop to any change of any kind. It might be a person who has been at the church longer than anyone else. It may be someone who's eloquent with persuasive words and has just a persuasive personality. It may be someone who's well-connected and related to many others in the church, or it might even be someone who's not even in formal leadership, but everybody knows that what he says carries more weight than everybody else. This is where the plurality of elders who are biblically qualified is essential. I think of one church years ago that had no elders. One man resisted the idea of elders, of shared leadership. Now he wasn't the pastor, 
They didn't have a pastor. They had no elders, but essentially he did the leading. He did the shepherding. He did everything. It was, I guess you would say, bivocational, but not too much of the vocational side of the shepherding was there. He had been long, there longer than anyone else. He was related to many people in the small church. He controlled everything. No one was willing to go up against him. Finally, one man, a middle-aged man, was willing to take a stand. He began teaching about eldership. And he began talking to people about eldership from the scripture. He knew his Bible well. And then he called an elders meeting and he invited those men that were qualified, biblically qualified, or, or who approximated the qualifications of elders. Two other men showed up. Neither one of them was the older man. Well, these three men now, the one who called the meeting and the two showed up, began acting as elders. Well, the older man, as you can imagine, did not like this. He tried manipulating, cajoling, coercing, trying to gain support, lobbying different people against these usurpers. But the new elders stood firm as a team. They weathered the resistance. In the end, the church accepted it. The old man faded into the background and no one listened to him anymore. He was marginalized. We as elders need to confront in a loving way but we need the courage to confront nonetheless when there's one or two strong men that are holding things up. Here's another thing that can hinder good decision making is when, when, when family is involved. There's a proverbial statement that says blood is thicker than water and I tried to do the history on that to find out where it comes from and no one's quite sure but the idea it conveys is very clear. Loyalty to one's relatives can very much skew a man's judgment. These things are stronger than you'd expect. When my children were teenagers, I know the feelings I had when decisions were being made that affected the youth and my teenagers. Um, sometimes it's wise for an elder to recuse himself. That means to pull himself out of the discussion and the decision making in cases that directly involve his family. Now one last issue that can really make decision making difficult is that when music is involved, it seems that music is one of those touchstone issues of existing churches. Music involves strong emotions. We hear a tune, a, a song, and it brings a flood of memories. Each generation, it seems, enjoys a different style and a different sound. And I find it's interesting that the Bible does not contain any audio recordings. We don't know what kind of music the early church enjoyed, or for that matter, what, what Israel enjoyed. Paul never instructed about the rhythms that are godly and which are worldly. We certainly don't know what kind of music God enjoys, whether he has a preference. What we can say is that if we are singing songs of worship and praise, the Lord desires our music be done in spirit and in truth. So how do elders approach this issue without dividing the church? <laughs> it seems like an impossible task. Well, I would say at the very beginning with much prayer, seeking God's wisdom and insight like any decision. But we need to recognize that besides just having a cognitive, mental decision-making process, we also need to recognize that some of our decisions like on concerning music touch people deeply and emotionally. And we need to be very careful as we help people work their way through this. So I would suggest we study that subject, we pray about it, we discuss it, we listen to each other's hearts and souls, but we need to address it in, with the heart of Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, where Paul says, Therefore, if any consolation in Christ, if there is any consolation of love or encouragement, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing with selfish ambition or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regarding one another is more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. As you know, decisions are difficult. How important it is to have a plurality of biblically qualified elders to discuss together, seek the Lord together, work together in leading people of God so that the church of God will not be deterred from its mission of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in all the world.